again and welcome to the Gospel of Mark. We are three episodes from completing this series. It's been a joy to be here each week. Father Mike Lestiri, who is the Director of Worship for the Diocese of Fresno and pastor of the beautiful parish of Immaculate Heart of Mary in Hanford. And Dr. Robert Maldonado, a philosopher from the California State University, Fresno. We're so glad that they have shared their passion for Mark week after week. I hope you've enjoyed and that you've become infected also. Um, Robert, could you open up by just showing some of the passages that we're going to be looking at in chapter 14? Well, here we're moving. Uh, uh, Jesus is, a, is about to be taken and, and delivered to the trials. And so uh, after he's captured, he has his uh, trial before the Sanhedrin. Uh, and then uh, Peter's uh, actual denial that Jesus had predicted, and then he, uh, Jesus moves over uh, to the trial before Pilate, uh, and then the, the, the via is going to start and uh, uh, on the way to the, to the actual cross. What we're going to do for these last programs is definitely read you Mark, because why would we want to comment without that you've heard the scripture, at least in an English translation. So let's begin by sharing Mark 14, 43 to 52. So Jesus had just said that the betrayer was at hand. Uh, and immediately while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I shall kiss is the man, seize him and lead him away safely. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Master, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. And one of those who stood by drew his sword and stuck, struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they forsook, forsook him and fled. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him. But he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Father Mike, what immediately in those texts that we just read, that Robert read, does deserve any comment right now? Well, needless to say, there's a lot of drama going on uh, between uh, the, the betrayal itself, then you have the violence, cutting off uh, the ear, you have... Uh, the seizing, if you will. There's a physical taking of Jesus. Uh, you have all of those kinds of things that are happening, and all of that moment, if you will, uh, that if you will, not only just, uh, it, it symbolizes the violence that I think the Martin community needed to, to kind of experience, and they were experiencing and would experience to the very end. And it's a part of the world we live in. And so therefore that violence. Also the, uh, the sense of being called rabbi, and again, um, a sign of respect, but is it, uh, was it, where does that come from, if you will, at that time, its usage or lack of, um, but obviously seeing Jesus as somebody who had something to offer as a teacher and, um, and, all, and all of that. So, um, again, a lot of drama all at one moment, but you have a, a sense of violence, which is a part of, of our world in which Jesus found himself towards in the end of his life. Robert, I'm going to put you on, the <laughs> on a hard question. Who is this young man uh, losing his uh, linen cloth? It seems to be mysterious. Commentators are all over the place with it. What do you think? Well, in, in seminary, we used to think it was what our teacher because he'd always blush when, <laughs> when it was this passage. <laughs> Uh, which I guess is about as good a guess <laughs> as it. He yes. was old enough. Um, but, uh, uh, well, the linen cloth is, is going to, is probably foreshadowing the burial. Uh, you know, it's, it could be, uh, I think one of the more common ideas is that it's, it's kind of a reference to Mark uh, or the author, whoever that is. Uh, I've always, I, I don't actually know, but, it, you know, the other person who runs away naked uh, is Joseph. Uh, in the in the Hebrew Bible, right? Potiphar's wife tries to uh, oh, yeah. get him, yeah. uh, and when he resists, uh, she grabs and he runs away naked. So I don't know. I, I think there might be some 
uh, intertextual comment there, but I don't know quite what it is. Since uh, none of the commentators are going to give us a, a clear answer on this, we'll let you all um, wonder about that one. Now the next passage is really brilliant and important. The Jesus before the Sanhedrin, and then it uh, evolves or devolves into Peter's denial, but these are contemporaneous events, and that's what's so brilliant is that Mark is putting them to really for us to see as if while one is going on, the other is going on, and to see the play of Jesus and Peter in front of his first community. Could we read that text? And they led Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes were assembled. And Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priest and the whole council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, their witnesses did not agree, and some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet not even so did their testimony agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he was silent and made him no answer. Against the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his mantle and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy! And the guards received him with blows. Robert, there's too much in here. It could be a whole program. We only have a moment. What is essential that we capture from this, this uh, grand jury? Well, uh, a lot of irony is going on. Uh, it's also uh, it, it's a difficult scene historically to, to figure out. Uh, this would not have been allowed because of the Passover in, in Jewish law. So it's hard to know exactly what, if anything, is the background of this episode. Uh, but it's interesting how Jesus is unresponsive, uh, mostly. I mean, he does find, he, he's silent for a while. It's almost as if Mark is saying through this narrative, everything has been said. You know, you have enough evidence, you, you know, I've, I've been speaking, I've been teaching, uh, that's what he came out to do, uh, to preach, and, and, and then of course the irony of the response, right? Mocking, spitting, saying prophesy, uh, clearly he's also demonstrated his power, his ability to both perform miracles but also to know things. He knew about the, the guy with the water jar and various kinds of things, so uh, he, he, he has said enough, he has presented enough and they still don't get it. Another person who doesn't get it, and a lot has been said, is our friend Peter. So let's read right now, just to get it fresh in our mind, what's going on in the courtyard below this. Let's pick up Peter and then start seeing any connection between these two scenarios contemporaneous. Um, I guess it's Robert to read. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the maids of the high priest came. And seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway. And the maid saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. And after a while, a little while, again the bystanders said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the cock crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, 
you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Father Mike, you have the great chance now to either work with what Robert just read or visit it backwards towards what's going on upstairs. What is the power of the way Mark sets up this grand scenario of Jesus' trial, whatever it was, and Peter's inability to even stand up for his best friend when a little girl asks him something? Well, obviously the contempt and also the sense that we go back and forth with Peter. Again, Peter not only in his denial, he can't stand up for his friend. He's showing that, again, he's not sure of the mission. And Jesus has the others who are around him more faithful, but not Peter. And we have Peter in, in all the denial. Uh, we also, there's contempt going on here, contempt about who this, this crowd that is, if you will, murmuring around the fireplace, it's if they're outside and they're just, who is this guy? He's a Nazarene, what, you know, going back, what good comes from Nazareth? You know, all that kind of thing, that there's that contempt, if you will, going on, even by the crowds. And then, of course, Peter chimes in with the contempt because he just says, well, I don't know, what, you know, I agree with you, I, I have no idea. Um, it's that messy, bloody, that whole sense of betrayal. It's that whole sense that they couldn't understand. They couldn't see that this was a part of the mission, and therefore they're going to let him be slaughtered. They'll, again, the sacrificial lamb comes back into picture because all of this just adds fuel to that fire that the message and the mission is just not being, if you will, followed through. Robert, is there anything left in these the two passages we just read, or is this our time for our little break? Well, I think just uh, to quickly follow up on Father Mike, too, the, you know, the Mark has given us the symbol of the true disciple, which was Bartimaeus. And what Bartimaeus did was he saw and he followed Jesus on the way to Jerusalem, where Jesus is going to be crucified. So Bartimaeus accepted that, uh, whereas Peter is denying it because he doesn't want to accept that cost of discipleship. I think at this point, having beaten up enough on Peter, because we're seeing week after week that Mark is almost unrelenting in showing how difficult it must be to truly accept this gospel, that it is a difficult, difficult challenge. We're going to take our break and come back and have Jesus this time presented in front of the Roman authorities through the person of Pontius Pilate. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. For over 25 years, KNXT has been serving the people of the San Joaquin Valley with good family television. That's just not available anywhere else. It's important for you, the viewer, to help support this valuable tool of ministry. KNXT needs to continue to grow and bring you important programming about your faith. But sometimes it's hard to stop and find the time. Make it easy. Go to KNXT.TV and find out how easy it is to support your Catholic television station, KNXT-TV. Here we are, um, actually in a new chapter, chapter 15. We're going to be seeing Jesus in front of the procurator. And Father Mike's going to read us now the next 21 verses that will get us through Pilate and Jesus and Pilate presenting Jesus to the populace. As soon as the morning came, the chief priest with the elders and the scribes, that is the whole Sanhedrin, held a council. They bound Jesus, led him away, handed him over to Pilate. Pilate questioned him, Are you the king of the Jews? He said to him in reply, You say so. The chief priest accused him of many things. Again, Pilate questioned him, Have you no answer? See how many things they accuse you of. Jesus gave him no further answer so that Pilate was amazed. Now, on the occasion of the feast, he used to release to them one prisoner whom they requested. A man called Barabbas was then in prison along with the rebels who had committed murder in a rebellion. The crowd came forward and began to ask him to do for them as he was accustomed. Pilate answered, Do you wish me to release to you the king of the Jews? 
for he knew that it was out of envy that the chief priest had handed him over. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate again said to him in reply, Then what do you want me to do with the man you called the king of the Jews? They shouted out, Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? They only shouted the louder, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and after he had Jesus scourged, handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the praetorium, and assembled the whole cohort. They clothed him in purple and, weaving a crown of thorns, placed it on him. They began to salute him with, Hail, King of the Jews, and kept striking his head with the reed and spitting upon him. They knelt before him in homage, and when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak dressed him in his own clothes, and led him out to crucify him. That is as much as we hoped we could cover today. Next week we'll be coming up with um, different texts. Robert, is there something in the Pilate judgment that you wanted to introduce us to um, either the man, his type of uh, governance, or this um, conversation he has with Jesus and with the crowd? Well, I guess the first thing to say is that Pilate comes off fairly well in the Gospels, uh, much better than everything else that we know about him from other historical sources. And, and it's understandable, I suppose, in that the Gospels are being written under the Roman Empire and, and trying to persuade the Roman Empire that their execution of Jesus was perhaps uh, not uh, justified and that uh, Pilate was not maybe as bad as he uh, actually was. And, and so Pilate comes off better and, and uh, the Jewish authorities come off unfortunately worse, uh, which of course leads to uh, all sorts of trouble. Um, but uh, I, I think one of the really horrific parts of this, obviously the whole thing is a horror story, but uh, the crowd has been the positive character uh, up till this point, and at this point, the crowd finally also falls. Right? They are the ones who are now shouting, uh, "Crucify him!" Right? So they have, uh, they, you know, they came. They are the ones that sort of try to get Pilate to release a prisoner. Uh, I don't think we know anything of this custom except in the Gospels. It doesn't really seem like Pilate's character much that he would do this, uh, but uh, I think the early implication is that they, they might be there to ask for Jesus' release, uh, but then they turn, and, and not only turn in requesting Barabbas, but then this just hor horrible uh, cry uh, to crucify Jesus. I, I find it just, uh, you, know, you know, we've spent a lot of time talking about Peter and yeah. Peter's failure, uh, but the, crowd's been good. They, the crowd has been good, and now they they too have fallen, and so uh, there's, but there, there's hope, you know. Because uh, it's not, the story isn't over yet. Father Mike, what else do you see in, in chapter 15, those first verses that you shared? Anything else to share with us? I, I just want to kind of, uh, the crowd, as we've, we've mentioned, it um, turns, if you will. But I, uh, Mark, uh, what is Mark trying to do there? And I, as I listen to that as well, you know, mystified all of a sudden, but it's also uh, Mark's way of, if you will, uh, to the end, uh, I think everybody lost sight of the mission. I think everybody lost sight of what Jesus is about. And so, and they probably felt all of a sudden, since he's not getting himself out of this, why there's something wrong. Maybe we were following the wrong guy. Maybe Mark is that the ultimate um, powerlessness of Jesus, that no one could understand that powerlessness that he was reflecting and he was representing. So they, even the crowd gave up because they wanted some kind of source so that he could pull himself out of, out of it, and he wasn't. And I, going back to Pilate, we know historically he was certainly not the most um, benefit, uh, beneficial ruler, but on the other hand, um, it's 
he sees it, he has insights into the conduct of the religious leaders. He knows they're using him. And um, you could almost come off as kind of like playing the game. He's just kind yeah. of like playing with everybody's feelings and so on. And, and certainly that, uh, then the whole thing about Jesus being, if you will, dressed in, uh, in purple cloth, the crowning of thorns, the, the whole contempt for, if you will, uh, leadership and all that kind of stuff, the power and so on. So you almost you're doing a parody of it, you know, with the crown of thorns and the and the purple cloak and all that kind of stuff. Um, it certainly all comes into play and and all just you know wrapped up in, in those few short lines. If one thing that I think Robert alluded to, and I think I'd like to say something and have both of the guests share more. Uh, Anti-Semitism. Um, it's actually rooted, we know, in the scriptures. It's rooted in the Gospels. There's a way that people have read the Gospels and wind up misunderstanding the, um, the power of the Jewish people as if they could execute, which is one thing to just know. It would have been the Roman government that had authority. Now, it comes off that the way Mark is presenting it He's very soft peddling the guilt or the responsibility, I think, of Pilate as if he's in some sort of a, he's okay on this because actually the Jewish community is sacrificing their king. Um, this has been for 2,000 years something the church has had to deal with. And I think it's very important as we're talking about the uh, Gospel of Mark and all Gospels to look at that issue. And on that note, I wonder if Robert and then Father Mike want to say a word about the need of dealing correctly with Jews or Judeans in this gospel. Well, I think it's, it's uh, sort of as you said, it's important to, one, know these things. Uh, Pilate, uh, Pilate was appointed uh, procurator in, in Judea at the recommendation of his good friend, Seg whose name was Seginus, who was famous in Rome for hating Jews. So he was an ancient anti-Semite. And he gets his good friend, Pilate, uh, put in place over, the, uh, over Judea. And, and of course, Pilate, I think, could care less. Mark tells us that Pilate was concerned about satisfying the crowd. Uh, I think Pilate could care less about that. Pilate had the right, uh, you know, he gave his soldiers the right of summary execution. He would have his soldiers march in the temple precincts with standards that would cause riots, which would give his soldiers opportunities to kill people. Uh, and, and so he could care less. He could care less about a sort of theological squabble uh, among, among Jews and under, under him. Uh, but he did care, I think, that Jesus had a popular following. And as soon as people started saying things like King of the Jews, even if they didn't understand it, uh, which presumably some of them would have, would have said because of the association with oiling the head and the coronation of a king, even though Mark is presenting this as a sort of ironic uh, uh, power and weakness king. Uh, and, and so, uh, that would be enough for Pilate to execute Jesus and, uh, and be done with it because as far as he was concerned, it wasn't worth it. Um, so I think knowing more of the historical circumstances, knowing that, that the Gospels are being told after the fact, as well as the Gospels are being written, as we saw all the way back at the beginning of the, of the program, they're being written in the, in the last third of the first century, which is a time when uh, Jews and Christians are splitting uh, more and more, and what it means to be both Jewish and Christian is being both defined against the other, and so that controversies between uh, Jews and Christians in the uh, late first century are sort of embedding themselves into the narrative of of the Gospels, uh, and not, not the time of Jesus. Father Mike. And lastly, I think what sometimes we tend to forget was, and again, the historical context, the Jews were also being persecuted, persecuted badly, as Robert mentions, but in the fall of Jerusalem, uh, which was a horrendous, if you will, attack on Judaism with the destruction of the temple, with the burning of the city, the very, the very heart and soul uh, of the people of Israel. And uh, they too, as you know, we always hear about the Christian martyrs 
at the hands of Romans, but we tend to also need to be reminded that the Jews were also suffering uh, martyrdom at the hands of their Roman oppressors. And so uh, the same, they too. And so to, to, to fit blame on any one group of people is terribly unfair because all the circumstances put together shows that um, again, it goes back to, to power being used by an oppressive uh, uh, political entity over minorities who pretty much were not uh, able to do much about those who had the might and the, and the financial wherewithal and the armies in, on their own turf. I think, uh, you know, another sort of analogy that's kind of helpful for me too is you know, you look at like oligarchies in, in Latin America, and so you have certain leadership that is exploiting or collaborating with other imperial powers, and, and, but they are not, I mean, they themselves are Latin American, uh, but they are not the, you know, there's a range. And, and just as there's ranges of beliefs there's, and politics, uh, the Jews in the New Testament often get sort of identified in this matrix of anti-Semitism as a monolith, a monolith that's been frozen since 2,000 years ago. And I think it's important to realize that uh, Judaism of the first century was just as rich and varied as it always was, as Christianity uh, was, is, and likely always will be. And so uh, it's not the Jews, it's maybe some Jews collaborated with, no, certainly some Jews collaborated with Rome. Uh, but. Uh, Jesus was Jewish, his followers were Jewish. He was a Jew speaking to Jews about Jewish things. We have one minute. I want to wonder if Greg could play, uh, show us that one slide again of the stained glass window showing us that scene of the trial and Peter warming himself in the fire. It's just an effort and I think if we go to churches and are carefully looking at stained glass and looking at some work, we can see something very powerful in this, an effort to combine, as the author did, as Mark did, having us see two things at once. I think that's one of our goals in our scripture study, to see the depth of one scene in another scene. And Father Mike and Robert have been helping us see that one motif in Mark does come up again and again and again. And I want to thank them for being here each week. We'll be back again next week, which will be the penultimate program. So please be there. Till then, God bless. Mm -hmm.